All right, so you're building an S21 and you're putting in this engine. Um, like I said before, most of it's going to be right out of the videos that already exist. Um, let me show you just some things before we button this one up that's directly more related to this airplane. Um, if you are, once you get to mount the engine, you know, the engine mount goes to the firewall like normal. And so that's all described. But you do have, if you have a nose wheel, there's a tab back here that goes behind this mount and it goes down this way. Now, nothing really different there other than it gets a little bit of a pain in the butt to have a nose wheel. It's nice because you don't have to deal with a tail wheel when you're flying, but in order to get the cowling off, um, you have to make some, some cuts. Like this piece here, by the way, is a, a piece that you get separate and you just you can just par rivet it in. We've glassed it into this airplane. And so the options basically is you pop rivet it in place and just paint it all or you can glass it in yourself if you want to, if you know fiberglass work. Or you can actually take this thing and just mount it to the, to the airplane and then, but I wouldn't recommend that. Just put it into the cowling. Pop rivets work really good for that. The rest of the airplane's pop riveted, they can be pop riveted. In any case, um, for a nose wheel airplane, you have to make these cutouts. And, and, you know, we can basically just send you a template of that so you don't have to reinvent what we did. You have to cut around the tubes here, you have to cut around the nose wheel, you got to cut around um, this for the radiator. In fact, for the even for the tail wheel, you have to cut around the radiator. Um, but you don't have to cut any of this for a tail wheel airplane. So, and you have to cut about almost up to the muffler pipe in order to, when you lower the cowling, that you can actually get it off the airplane. So that's one thing that would be a little bit different. Uh, we also tried, and it does work if you want to, when it's all done, you can put four nut plates, like two here and uh, two over there. And then you can put a plate across here and that kind of closes this up. So when you look from the front, you only have like a, an opening here and then there's a, a cover plate here. And that gives you just a little bit more speed. Uh, you'd have to set the, the length of the plate so that you have, you know, whatever opening you need and you can adjust it then for how much cooling you want. It gives you just a tiny bit more speed. Uh, Kathy's going to play with that when she gets it back. All right, so that's the bottom part. Now let's, um, and the nose wheel. We ended up having a big opening for the exhaust. Reason for that was initially we had an augmenter tube that came through here and we decided to kind of make that smaller. I'll show you up on top. We basically used all of that idea of a shield, titanium shield, but we did not bring it down as far into the cowling as we initially had. We left the big opening. You can start with a smaller one and just kind of work your way up. But we found that dumping the exhaust heat throughout through that big opening was nice. I mean, it works perfectly now. We have incredibly good cooling. And, uh, but yeah, you can start, you know, with a, just a smaller hole and then if you have to open it up, you just open it up. Uh, most likely with this new uh, ramp that we added here, the, the cooling was just absolutely incredibly, uh, you know, the, the amount of cooling was so much better than what we had before. We had all the air coming through the front here before and it would find its way through here. Uh, and this was all closed up, but with this reverse ramp, that really, really helped. And uh, even on the hottest of days now, it barely goes over 200 degrees. So, so that was good. Here's another thing that we did. Um, this engine has the exhaust manifold built into the cylinder head. Now, because of that, there's a little extra load on the cooling system. It has to cool this. And so there's more expansion between cold and hot of the coolant. So what you end up uh, doing is we had a, our standard uh, tank right here for the coolant overflow. By the way, we don't use any pressure cap on this system. Um, we just basically come right off the top of the thermostat here and uh, pressure expands and contracts with the temperature of the engine. Now, there's more expansion on this engine than, like for, than some of the other engines we work on because of the 
the uh, amount of coolant that's used to cool the exhaust manifolds. So basically, that bottle wasn't big enough. So we stuck one over here for, we're gonna have it here for the first you know, 20, 30 hours of flying. And it was uh, like night and day. We now have plenty of expansion and contraction. We have no coolant spilling on the firewall. It, it was the way to go. So we're putting a bottle, not quite this big, this is just what we had happened to have, but we're gonna replace this bottle with one that's taller. And that's gonna be the final as far as the cooling system. And you're gonna be running a hose from the bottom of that bottle and you run your um, you run your hose then up to here and that takes care of the cooling system um, these caps are vented they have a vent built in right there and then it vents down through the threads this larger bottle has a tiny little hole in the o of the cap so but most likely we'll end up with a, a bottle just of this this fabrication right here we've used that for years but a taller one so that takes care of hooking up the cooling as far as mounting the radiator you're going to do that exactly like our radiator video says how to mount the radiator you're going to be able to use the screws in the front here and then you can use 316 pop rivets back here because there's some double floors in here and it's hard to get a uh, screw and a nut in there. We built this part on the back. If there's interest in it, then uh, we can make a little kit for that. Uh, give another two knots, three knots maybe, and kind of finishes the whole thing up a little bit in the back. So cooling system, basically look at our radiator installation video. Uh, that's optional, that back piece there. The uh, the reverse ramp underneath here worked out really good, so that's going to be included in the in the kit. The exhaust, um, yeah, uh, start with a smaller hole, then you can open it if you need to. Exhaust is mounted to the side. This oxygen sensor is for testing. You you won't be needing that, um, so it doesn't come with it. There's a metal gasket behind the exhaust. Here's our. Um, blow-by, breather blow-by from, from the cover right here. And you're just gonna attach it here and have a little piece of pipe uh, touching the exhaust and the, any, any oil fumes that come off just burn up right there. Your muffler will come with a titanium shield. These nuts are all 200 inch pounds. And down there you've got the a couple of springs and a band clamp around the muffler. And that keeps the tailpipe from vibrating so that uh, you won't have a crack in your exhaust over time. And then we just uh, added a bolt down there. Let's see if we can get a little video of that. All of our models have this, but they're all slightly different. Um, as you see, we added a bolt through a hole that was in the, in the uh, aluminum there, but then there wasn't enough room for a nut, so we just put a little Loctite and basically a little hokey actually, but it works just fine. And that's just to have a place to attach the other end of the spring, a couple of washers and then the spring. And then it goes up to the clamp, which is up here. You don't want to tighten the clamp too much. You just want it to be a slip fit. Reason for that, everything expands and it could bust the clamp if the tailpipe expands before the clamp does. All right, so that's the muffler system. That's how that goes. And, and yeah, just putting that little spring tension on this keeps it from vibrating and keeps it from cracking over time. Here is where the um, pass-throughs were made for ground and positive. Bob installed a shunt in the middle here. Um, this one actually is a little bit weak. It's from, I think from Dynon, I'm not sure. But the plastic, we could always see a tiny little crack in the plastic. So maybe it's because of the firewall flexing a little bit right there. So keep that in mind if you have that exact shunt. Maybe leave the screws a little bit loose or something. Now, here's the uh, thermostat inside these four screws. Uh, then a, this is the hot side of the coolant. We've got an elbow that turns down. 
This piece of pipe here is stainless steel. Everything else is aluminum. This is stainless because it goes right next to the muffler. So we supply that. Then we got a, a couple of 90s there. And we tie it to the engine mount with an ADL clamp there just so that this whole thing is rigid or you don't want it too rigid, but you know, it can move. But it is attached way down there, so there's plenty of flexibility uh, all the way up here where it mounts to the engine because the engine vibrates and we want some flexibility between those two. And then that attaches to the radiator, uh, just like on other installations. Now, here we have coolant coming back from the radiator. And this is a, it has two O-rings in it and it's just kind of a slip, slip fit, and it's supposed to be, and it's just held in by this plate. Um, and so that's, that's left that way and it's, it's purposely that way. Honda uses one O-ring in here, we use two O-rings in there. Um, your tensioner for the alternator is right here. And um, once in a while, check this belt and the idler pulley, that, that it's nice and snug. And um, idler pulley has uh, about 500 hours worth of life or five years. Other than that, um, let's uh, look at this guy. Um, Bob wanted me to add, and I did, um, a shield between this shield and the oil pressure transducer. So we did that, and that's because the radiant heat off of this uh, getting on the sensor. So good idea. Here's the heater output. This goes to the heater right here. That's the hot side. And then there's a return from the heater right here back into here. And the heater is located inside. And there is a hose right there going into the cabin. And then there's another one over on the other side. And the heater was mounted in the middle of the firewall inside here. And there's the heater. And it really, really works good. Uh, we do prefer, uh, this was not done that way, but ideally to have the heater stick through the firewall, the aluminum barbs, and then put the hoses on the outside. Um, this was done a little differently with the hoses inside. So, obviously it works just fine, but by having it the other way, if there's a leak in the hose, it'll be outside rather than inside the cabin. There's our pass-through that we use. So it's got screws from this side and a silicone piece of hose cut slit in order to adjust the amount of space that we needed in the pass-through. So that comes with your firewall forward kit and enables you to easily, by taking that cover out, you want to leave the opening quite big, uh, you know, like almost as big as the cover. Makes it easy while working on the airplane. You can even put some chafing material on the sharp firewall edges while you work on the airplane. And then when you're done, that machine piece closes all that up and you never have to worry about like pulling wires through or not get your hand through there while you're working on the plane and then close it up at the end. Uh, what else we got? Um, this is a uh, uh, you know, customer installation if you have a MAP sensor. This is a very flexible hose from McMaster, like a silicone hose. So it's able to fit um, a little bar bigger barb right here and then go on to the Dynon MAP sensor here, which is a smaller diameter. Could also use a, a reducer, a brass reducer or something like that. Um, VIP, this is a variable in-flight adjustable propeller. This bracket goes on, um, bolts to the uh, hole right there, and then it picks up another hole further down underneath there. And, and so it picks up this bolt here and, and this one here. And then this arm comes out here. The actuator is attached to that. The VIP uh, bar that actually does the pushing of the rod that makes the prop turn is right there. All right, so that's basically the whole VIP thing other than running the, the wires into the cockpit 
and then mount your controller to the panel and then obviously wire the controller according to its installation instructions. So it needs power and ground and and uh, you know wire it to your avionics bus and then it needs the two wires from the actuator and that's pretty much it. Uh, RPM input it also needs from the ECU of the computer of the engine. So that's not hard, um, pretty simple system. Here is the same as every airplane that we we recommend the wiring for battery, battery, fuel pump, fuel pump, computer. The computer switch, a lot of times we don't leave that, put that in there, the ECU on off. If you can do an excellent wiring and you, and you have an excellent switch and stuff, then you can have an ECU switch. Otherwise, we always recommend to wire it directly to the contactor. So when they come on, the ECU also comes on. There are pros and cons to everything. Um, if you can have a reliable ECU switch, then the skinny wire of the ECU power goes here and the fat wire goes to the contactors. Uh, if not, both wires go to the contactors for power. One advantage of this is that you can turn the engine off just by turning that off and power is still left to the ship. And if you have a data logger, which you know we recommend, um, and every engine can, you can purchase a data logger like this that plugs into the ECU harness has an SD card and every time you power up and shut down the ECU but leave power to the actual uh, circuit board of the ECU but you're just turning it on and off, the, turning the computer on and off, it will save a file here. It will save a file every time the engine is started and stopped. And uh, so that could be you know, good for troubleshooting in the future if you ever needed it. All right. Um, Let's go back to the engine before we close this up. Here's an adjustment for the VIP. You can adjust it here, sliding it in and out. You can adjust it by setting the length of the rod inside there. So a couple of adjustments there for fine tuning. Other than that, um, you know, it's very, very standard uh, as far as similar to, let's say a Zenith 650 or 750 or cruiser so you just look at all those videos we have online and and you're going to find that the the basics of installing things are going to be the same all right let's close her up